So I'm currently hanging out with my friend here, okay. here in, in the Toki of Yo. I'm surprised you still have those, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and. <laughs> it's just hitting me below the belt right away. Anyway, hanging out with my friend, and uh, he's graciously letting me stay at his place. The last time that I was here, uh, I, and this is something that's kind of happened to me more in my uh, the recent years, I've started to scream in my sleep a little bit more. Uh, okay. And... Uh, wait, just, just out of curiosity, what kind of a scream is it? Ah! Okay, so we're not talking like Bjork territory or anything like that. It's like a panicked scream. It could be a Bjork scream. If I were an Icelandic witch princess. You mean you're not? I'm almost there. You're almost there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Th that's the next test you have to pass. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I dress like it. I'm acting like it in my older age. You, you've got a cold demeanor that you show to me every time we speak. I do not. You stop it. <laughs> See, th that's why when people are like, oh, you should just live stream the whole thing. It's like, we are so not funny. <laughs> we are so unfunny. And through the magic of editing, it sounds better. Hello, my beautiful animal buddies. Friends, thank you for joining us today on the Nintendo Everything Podcast, episode 65. My name is Oni Dino. With me, I have Isabel's little brother, a huge disappointment to their family, constantly living in the shadow of his more successful older sister. It's Galen. I mean, you're still gonna go ahead and, like, take whatever request that I have because... Uh, Mama needs those bells. Why are you Mama? Why aren't you? I don't know where this analogy is going anymore. <laughs> I, you know, I feed you material and you, it's like, it's like when you try and take a bite of food, but you miss your mouth entirely. <laughs> That's you. Uh, I would be amiss if I said that that has never happened to me, actually. I recently tried to take a drink of water and literally threw the water over my shoulder. I don't know. Like, am I an android? And do I dream of electric sheep and it malfunctioned that day? What's going on? Yes. Yes to all of those things. Oh my god. Or am I dancer? <laughs> You're certainly not human. That, that was the joke. Yes, we have, to, we have to put three points in there. Yeah, it's comedy. Yes and. The dialogue that's in there, it's corf, coarse, and rough, and it just gets everywhere. No, corf. That's what it is. It's corf. It, it's corf and rough. <laughs> corf sounds like a town in, in Ireland. Uh, no, I'm thinking I of Cork. To... It is a town in Ireland. I have been there. I have been, I have been to there. How, how was Cork? Tell me about Cork. Uh, Cork is amazing. Uh, it's County Cork, and it... <laughs> it is the place that I go to in my subconscious when I, like... Do you have a meditation place where you just go to to be calm? No, I live in a shady nightmare. Well, go to County Cork, drive around on the other side of the road, but this is not the <laughs> Ireland Everything podcast. Hey, it can be. <laughs> I'd be okay with that. Uh, let's go to Ireland sometime this this year whenever tickets are cheap and let's just have like a nice little visit over there. I've just been dying to go. 100%. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I are actually talking about trying to find a way to go again this year. So yeah, we should 100% make this a thing. Also, if we can go to the countryside and we can meet the sorry me whole guy, I would love that. <laughs> Uh, that is most of the people that I know out there who would say something like that. <laughs> I was just talking to my friend about this just before the podcast. They're probably my favorite, I guess, meme of the last year or the last several years is the Irish guy who is yelling at the other rich Irish guy 
for going out to the countryside and tossing his mattress in, you know, the beautiful countryside. And then the guy living there is like, like, what are you doing, you know? And he, but he's specifically, he says, Ah, oh, sorry, me hole. <laughs> Instead of like, you know, sorry, my ass, which is what I think most people would say. <laughs> Where do you live? And that totally makes sense that that, uh, that reaction would have happened because... From what I understand, and my wife can explain this a lot better than I can, they they get charged for the weight of the garbage that gets mm-hmm, picked up. Mm-hmm. So composting, recycling, that kind of a thing is really big over there. So if you have some jerk off who's just driving around dumping their trash in somebody else's place, like that's like rolling up and just taking a dump on your front lawn. Like, well, it's worse. Really- <laughs> it's taking the heaviest dump. It's he- taking the heaviest of dumps. A really heavy dump that you have to pick up. And it's not With even your springs. dump. <laughs> 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 also, that, that drives me, like, absolutely wild. Like, why why is that a law? Because, I mean, I understand, you know, the financial responsibility of that. But, like, mm-hmm. what do you think is going to be the outcome of somebody having to pay for heavy trash? They're just going to throw it away in somebody else's thing. You can't trust people to be good. You know, from the the owners of the B&B that we stayed at when we were out there, they actually were telling me that it kind of changed their entire mindset of, no, you, you want to, this is just to help encourage the recycling and everything like that. Yeah, but I think one of the negative outcomes is w- what we see, is the sorry me whole situation. <laughs> I'd have that in the garage. <laughs> I, should, I should not be doing an Irish accent. It's fun to do, but they always sound terrible. It sounds always like an American doing an Irish accent. You know what? You do sound a step above Lucky Charms, so you're not that bad. Well, the, the, but that's like the the exaggeration. The Not exaggeration. What's that called? Uh, stereotype, you know? Just like when mm-hmm. you know people would say like an American accent would be like, Oh my god! D- did you see how tiny that person's car is? <laughs> you know what I mean? I bet you it gets 35 miles to the gallon. What's a gram? <laughs> What's a kilometer? <laughs> is that in space? <laughs> or we can go to the southern side of the U.S. <laughs> Where they actually sa- okay, I can't. I just had this conversation with a friend. That's but the, the southern states actually have a more, uh, in theory, uh, closer accent to classical British accents than current modern British accents. Huh. So like the the theory is that. Oh God, I'm so sorry. This is now the linguistics everything <laughs> podcast. This is supposed to be the opening of our show, and here we are just shooting the shit. Um. Okay. Very briefly. People are like, why do American accents sound so different from British accents? How did they change so much? It actually seems to be the other way around, that British accents have changed over time more often than American accents have. That's Mm. why, like, the Roddick R is present in places like West Country and um, Ireland and Scotland. Because Mm. that's the way that they used to speak. And then the common folk would, in Britain, would imitate the royalty you know, because of status and stuff. And then that just became the accent. Huh. That's at I least a theory, but it's a heavily uh, supported theory. I I like seeing where that theory is going. This is like deja vu because I was just talking to my friend about all of this, but it's the least important thing in the whole wide world, but I find it so <laughs> fascinating. Welcome to the Nintendo Everything Podcast. Yeah, we talk about video games here. 20 minutes into this damn episode, <laughs> I hope all of our new listeners are with us and they're like, why am I listening to this? Why am I listening to this podcast? <laughs> God. What's going to be talked about in this episode? Why am I using passive language? We're, no, I like that. I like that. No, it's awful. Man, when I was... When it's was, unique. It's different. It is awful, <laughs> and it's bad actual writing in in you know English standards. When I was living in Japan, because you use a lot of passive language, then I went back to America and I was writing papers and stuff. I was using passive language left and right. My like English professor was like, "What are you doing? Like, <laughs> is this not your first language, right? English? 
You, you know, it's there's actually a theory that it is closer to the old English version of writing as opposed to the newer one because of the separation. Sorry. <laughs> the separation of what, Galen? I, I don't know. I don't know. Yes, Anne, continue. <laughs> you gotta commit to the joke, bro. <laughs> no, I'm bailing out. I'm bailing out of the joke. <laughs> oh, God. Expect no commitments from us at Nintendo Everything Pod at gmail.com. <laughs> All right, this episode, we're going to talk about video games, I promise. We're going to talk about the news about Pokemon Home, uh, some Animal Crossing junk. I went to a Grasshopper Manufacturer event recently, and we're going to talk about No More Heroes, a bunch of Switch sales, and financial resor- results. God, my Re- L's and my results? R's. Results? Results. <laughs> it's not even early. What? I have no excuse. It's late for me. But anyway, I'm sure this episode is going to be uh, very pleasant and banal, and Galen and I won't even argue over anything once. Right? Right, Galen? Uh, I disagree with this. How? How are we disagreeing already? <laughs> because I'm right. <laughs> Dude, you are never right. L- listen uh, back to the track record on this. Oh yeah? So are you disagreeing about us arguing? No. <laughs> yes so this logical should... fallacy i did it yeah you, you are a phallus see so i should have said this way fallacy. earlier in the episode stop it so i should have said this way earlier in the episode stop it god you sound like a tire a punctured tire <laughs> we're a weekly show episodes go live every sunday sometimes they go live on monday apparently sorry about last week um, yeah. Uh, just check us out. We're on all the podcast platforms. Whatever you're listening to us on right now, try a different podcast platform out next time. I, I mean, don't. I mean, you can. I don't know whatever I'm trying to say here. We're on iTunes. We're on Spotify. Spotify been blowing up for us a lot lately, too. So thank you very much to people recommending us on Spotify or whatever. Like, I don't know why, but that's, that number is just increasing. We're on Stitcher. We're on Overcast. Whatever. Whatever it is, you name it, we're there. I really want to start giving out punch cards for people who listen to this, where they get a punch for each different platform that they listen to the show on. Oh, yeah. And when you get all of them, you get a free insult by Oni Dino. No, it has to be something rarer. I give that out way too often. Oh, you give a, you get a good joke by me. That one was a freebie. <laughs> that was a really good one. That was a really good one. See, this is what I do. I insult and manipulate you to the point of self uh, de- deploration, deprecation, mm. whatever word, and then you start hating on yourself. I am the Icelandic witch queen. <laughs> whatever. As long as you keep agreeing with me, we're good. Correct. <laughs> So anyway, all of our lovely listeners, please, if you could help us out by leaving a review on iTunes that helps us get recommended through the algorithm, share us with other people, recommend us in your Discord communities or whatever, anything you can do helps, and it helps us to continue growing and continue making the show. So thank you very much. Yeah. Now let's talk about video games. But first, <coughs> Galen, where can people find you on the Tweetar? Oh, uh, you can find me on the Tweetar, which, uh, fun story, is not the logo of a bird. <laughs> at mm. Mobius087. And then I'm on the Tweetar, at Oni underscore Dino. And at those places we talk about video games sometimes, and we post pictures mm-hmm. about what video games we're playing that week. And come chat with us about video games, yeah? Yeah. Galen, what have you been playing this week? Uh, I've actually been getting quite a bit of gaming in. Uh, First off, I have actually got my hands on the new Billith character in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Excellent. And also, before you go into that, just want to say you're doing a really good job on your uh, New Year's resolution of becoming a real gamer. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, I've got my uh, Astro headset in the mail, so, you know, it's only a matter of time. Astro? Yeah. What is that? Is that a new streamer? no, it's it's a brand of headphones that are really popular for like high end, like headphones for gaming. 
Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> it was a joke that was funny to the people who make fun of pro gamers. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, yeah. Because I saw a really excellent tweet before about how those, like, gamer chairs, you know, the ones that are, like, super cool looking, that kind of thing, they are exactly like um, those car seats that you put your baby in so they don't get hurt. <laughs> it's just the whiner, baby, piss baby gamer seats. Uh, true story, I absolutely hate those chairs. <laughs> they look very uncomfortable. Like, you can get a, an ergonomic comfortable ass chair mm. they've got them in offices i uh <laughs> fun story at work i we did an office remodel and they let me do all the ordering for like the new furniture for like the office and everything uh i might have kind of sprung my budget a little bit on the chairs so Gaelic. everybody has like 500 hundred dollar serta like comfort therapeutic chairs <laughs> well at least you did a good thing you didn't just like order pens that were too expensive you know what i mean at least yeah, you did yeah. that for other people but if they're like here we're gonna trust you with the budget and then you're gonna go over budget like what you're asking to, you I... you wear your chains man i'm telling <laughs> you your entire life you've been wearing your chains willfully to be to be fair i did not go over budget i stayed within the budget in the sense that they gave me no budget so they said just don't oh my you know, god go into quadruple digits and i was Th like okay i can make this work this is such a galen answer to be like you know what i didn't technically <laughs> do it wrong you know what i mean like technically it's this or whatever it's so you <laughs> so tell me about the technicalities of billeth uh so billeth is very fun to play as and i feel like i should kind of preface this a little bit with my original impressions for the announcement versus playing it. Um, okay. A lot of what I had predicted of the character kind of came true. Uh, there is nothing that feels particularly special about this character. Okay. Compared to, like, Joker or Piranha Plant. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> Piranha Plant felt really, really different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but mechanically, like, the idea of using the different weapons and everything it's just what i thought it's different it's learning the different smash attacks and kind of just learning the move set of the character that being said i have to say that this is one of the more well balanced characters that i like feeling wise huh i've seen a lot of really good compilations of them using the the axe i don't know what it's called because oh yeah i think we haven't really have we not seen a character like this where they have a super armor and they're still gonna go do their attack so like people mm -hmm. are you know trying to get used to trying to get accustomed to uh you can't hit them to get them out of that animation so yeah. people like go in to try and hit them during that animation and they still get like absolutely obliterated by that axe Th there happens to be a combo that I've only been able to pull it off like once or twice since I've started using it, but it's so satisfying when you actually get it off. And what you do is... Oh, you, you might want to rephrase that! <laughs> no, never mind. I'm keeping it in. <laughs> when you uh, whip it out, you grab right. the other guy. Right, better. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, you do an up throw. And then while they're in midair, you do the up B attack, which is the whip. You latch onto the other guy, you pull yourself up to the person's position, so now you are in midair. Yeah. You knock them back, and you knock them down. It's very reminiscent of, like, one of the first combos I learned in this game, which was as Link using the hookshot, grabbing him, throwing him up, and then jumping and doing the up B attack. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, it, it, very similar in that respect. However, after you hit them with the up B, and they are falling down you immediately do your down smash attack as you're falling. And if you time it just right, you are just coming straight down with the hammer on top of them. Oh, And cool. it is, the framing has to be very precise, but it is so satisfying when you get it off. That sounds like some sweet strats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm just, I'm enjoying the character. I went through classic mode. Didn't get the high score like I did with Banjo-Kazooie, but the classic mode is all HP-based. It's all stamina-based, as opposed to trying to knock everybody off. 
I will not spoil the last boss, but I will say I didn't see that coming. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, just overall, I like the character, but it didn't change my opinions on it. I still feel like it is a very safe character for them to have put out. Yeah. I feel like it's very well-balanced for somebody who's looking for a well-balanced character. This definitely will fit the bill for you. Oh, uh, it'll fit the billeth? Fit the billeth. Ah, I, li- I, I see what you did there. I like that. Uh-huh, yeah, this low-hanging fruit. <laughs> it was actually fruit that already fell off the tree, and it was uh, a little bit rotten. You know what? I'll, I'll give you a little bit more than that. I'll say that it was falling off the tree, but you snatched it out of midair. With my sword whip! My sword sure. of the creator! We'll go with that one. That said, I found myself using the bow attack as my primary way to get through classic mode. <laughs> oh, is it too good? What? No, it just... Uh, cl- Classic mode sets you up against, like, a lot of multiple enemies, and when you're doing stamina-based, it can sometimes get a little difficult when you're running into everybody who almost all the characters have a counter of some type. So, throwing them away, (laughs) running to the other side... Yeah. Um, Throwing them, running to the other side of the stage, turning around, and then just spamming your charged arrow shot is definitely a way to go. Uh I'm not going to say it's the best way, but it gets the job done. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, other than that, haven't gone through spirit mode yet, uh, so you might hear a little bit more of a thorough impression from me later down the road. Excellent. Yeah. Um, you know, something I was, like, reflecting on about Billith, because, you know, it's still, it's still just such an interesting character choice for the fifth mm-hmm. DLC character, you know, leading up to that. I, I think I said last week on the podcast that this feels like a character that should be character number one of yes, a DLC I pack. Agree. I have actually been thinking about that opposite now, where I, I still don't think that this is a good character choice for, you know, number number five. I think this would be a good number two, actually, in the second DLC pack, because in DLC pack... Oh, Jesus. The character of pack... <laughs> Jesus confirmed for Smash Bros. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. That would be stupid. It would be really stupid, but it'd, I'd be great. Uh, anyway, character five of pack one should be something super hype because you want to get people hyped for pack number two, right? Mm-hmm. Character number one of pack two should also be something super hype because you want people to buy that whole pack, right? So Correct. that's where Billith would come in, number two of pack two. Okay. You follow me? Okay. That, that was a lot of numbers. I'm very sorry. No, I, I understand your flow chart on this. Okay. But still, still just a wild choice. I'm very glad that Billith is in this game, for sure. I, <laughs> I love Fire Emblem Three Houses so much. But it it was just freaking weird. <laughs> the, the only way it could have been better is if it was a Tokyo Mirage Sessions character, which we'll get to. Mm-hmm. And uh, then it just would have upset so many people, and I would have just eaten it up. <laughs> You know, I have yet to come across any Tokyo Mirage Session spirits in the game, so... <gasps> there is hope. <laughs> On the topic of spirits, tell us about your spirit animal game. Wow. That was bad, Galen. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to, like, edit that because it's so embarrassing? So I've been playing Tokyo Mirage Sessions... <laughs> Sharp FE Encore on the Nintendo Swanch. Finally gotten some gaming in with this. This game is still so good, man. Mm-hmm. I was like wondering, okay, how am I going to you know, feel going back to it? Because yeah, I'm excited that it's on Switch. Excited more people are going to try and play it because um, I really enjoyed it back on the Wii U. But is it going to hold up? You know, is it is some of the magic going to be gone? Honestly, it's still so good. Still so good. That's amazing. So, for new listeners who have not heard you, um, I don't want to say, like, gloat about this game, but you definitely talked pretty prolifically about it. I do like this game. Give me the elevator pitch of this game for somebody who has never heard of this game before. (laughs) So, here's my elevator pitch. What if you were a kid wanting to get into the Japanese entertainment industry in modern-day Tokyo, however... You also really like rocket-propelled 
Pegasuses? Pegasies? And that... also your sister disappeared seven years ago and you gotta find her? That just sounds like every Japanese kid who wants to get into the music industry. I mean, I've got a rocket-propelled Pegasus on the ready, don't you? <laughs> and a sister who went missing. <laughs> and also, a little bit of Fire Emblem. Okay. Just a little bit, like a dash. So, yeah, that that's going to be one of my questions. So, I have not played this game myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how does the Fire Emblem brand come into play in this game right 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 okay so honestly like seriously now like we're just getting serious uh mm -hmm. th what this game really is is like i said modern day kids in tokyo getting into the japanese entertainment industry like one wants to be a singer with a positive image one wants to be a stage performer one wants to be an actress all the things in between that involve the entertainment industry it's not just singing it's all these things okay and if you have a lot of talent, your talent that, you know, everybody has is called Performa. So everybody has, you know, either a little bit or a lot of bit or whatever. And it kind of seems to be that, like, if you have a lot of Performa, you're able to see these beings from another world called Mirages. And they're harvesting humans' Performa. And that's, you know, kind of the antagonist and that's the bad stuff that's going on in the world. It's not super explained so far. Okay. I actually am a little bit hazy on it, but <laughs> it's fine. We're moving on. Anime. <laughs> yeah, it sounds very Sailor Moon hunting for the heart crystals type, you know, MacGuffin. Anime. It's like, they do something. The yeah. bad guys want them. And magical schoolgirl transformation. <laughs> yep, you can henshin like a muffa in this game. You know what? Sometimes that's all you need. So this other world is mm, kind of like a strange version of Fire Emblem, and that's where things are coming from. Not all okay. of the enemies are Fire Emblem, you know, like the jobber enemies are not all from there, but some of them are. The main allies and main enemies that you are, you know, going up against, they are all from Fire Emblem. But they're weird Shin Megami Tensei versions of them, so... They're just, they're weird, crazy things, like, uh, and, and that's some of my favorite stuff is the character designs for, you know, um, enemies and allies, where it's like, uh, for example, I think her name is Inversa, I forgot her name, she's from, uh, Fire Emblem Awakening. Uh, okay. she's an antagonist, but then in this game, and she's, you know, a human in that Fire Emblem Awakening, but in this game, she is like a pegasus but she doesn't really have arms they're kind of like these long wing things she's got a huge enormous enormous horn coming out of her head she's got boobies like wow and she's got a back end that's a horse and it's just <laughs> it's a huge crazy monstrosity of a design and i i love that kind of stuff i love creature design okay. and just weird stuff that's why i love shin Megami tensei so much is because some of the stuff you're like oh this is a a sexual Giger-esque monstrosity you know it's just evil looking it's great so to see characters in a Fire Emblem series be reimagined and redesigned in that way is super cool so like even if you're not you know super into this game if you're a Fire Emblem fan just look up some of these character designs you know Krom looks so different uh, Sheeta looks like super cool and mysterious because she's got this huge visor over her face. You never see her face really. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's sort of the, the premise of, of what's happening, right? And you befriend some of these Fire Emblem characters and they kind of become your stance. You know, they become like sort of your weapon in battle. And then you fight with the weapon. You're transforming into like a cooler version of yourself. There's lots of little Fire Emblem connections in this game, whether it's the gameplay or whether it's the story. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely its own unique thing, so you don't need to have played Fire Emblem to get into this. It's more of just like the characters are alluding to that, and it's kind of like Easter eggs for those who would be appreciative enough to recognize them. Yeah, yeah. I but mean, they're not It's necessary. a little more than that, but it's it's not like it's dependent upon having played Fire Emblem. They, they balanced it off pretty well. Okay. 
But so anyway, the, the main story is that like your main female heroine, her sister, who was a stage performer, she went missing in a huge disappearance in a theater like seven years ago or something. So your main character, her name is uh, Tsubasa, she was affected by these events, clearly. And so mm. she wants to enter the entertainment industry herself in hopes of finding her sister and to positively influence others. So that's your premise, that's your setup, character motivation and such, it all unfolds from there. Nice, nice. Yeah, so pretty standard, like the story isn't super amazing, but it's solid for sure. And the, the real star of this is the battle system and just like the huge flamboyance of the battles and how the story unfolds. <laughs> so the battle system is like a turn-based JRPG, right? Okay. Obviously, my absolute bread and butter. Not even my bread and butter. This is my meat and potatoes. <laughs> this is your go-to. Yes. <laughs> and the core of these battles is stringing together things called sessions. Sessions are like combo attacks. They are very Fire Emblem and Shin Megami Tensei inspired, where you have your weapon triangle, uh, elemental weaknesses and stuff that you have to... Uh, exploit and also be careful of like your enemies can also string together these combos so you know things can turn on a dime so you got to be on on your toes hmm okay and if you're a fire emblem you know fan if you've played those games then you kind of already have a little bit ahead of you where it's like you encounter a brand new enemy and you see that that enemy has an axe you might know right away like oh i should use my sword user because sword beats axe in fire emblem right yep or if you fight a flying enemy you might be like "Ooh, i should maybe try a wind attack or i should use a bow attack because probably they're going to be weak to that stuff hmm. so you know that's that's a little bonus for fire emblem people but that's for when you encounter a brand new enemy because you don't know what they're weak to at all and there's a million different things there's you know the the four different weapon types of sword lance axe uh bow and then there's all these elements too so it's all about exploiting those things and defending against those things and stringing together those combos that are just so much fun. I I can definitely see the kind of the gameplay loop that catches you and just wanting to wanting to see where you can take everything. It's like if you're at a restaurant and you order a steak and you're like, all right, I know that or something hearty like that. And you're like, all right, I know that this is going to be good. And then the steak comes to you and then it's like also got these little accoutrements on the side. Like, oh, cool. It's got some veg over here and like some other stuff over here. I didn't expect that to be here. And I didn't expect to pair those things together. But you know what? It works out so good. And that steak. I'm, I'm very hungry right now. I'm very sorry. <laughs> that steak also tastes super good you're like whoa this is better than i expected and each bite that you have of the steak you're like this like it's not fading in flavor like this is still super good i'm very hungry so you're telling me that overall this is a very well balanced and delectable experience delectable sure <laughs> Uh, so clearly, I'm going to keep going with this game. I love Tokyo Mirage Sessions. I think that this game, of course, because of the, oh God, the, uh, what was it called? Censorship controversy is just overshadowing so much about why this game is good. I'm going to be playing it some more. You're going to be hearing me talk about it more for sure. <laughs> also, if you have questions about the censorship controversy thing, one of our episodes before, I don't remember which one it was, we talked about this to death, so I won't really go into it oh, yeah. too much. But if you have questions, you know, feel free to write into us because I unfortunately know way too much about that whole controversy just from following the news <laughs> and, you know, being personally invested in this game. So yep. feel free to write into us, Nintendo Everything Pod at gmail.com. But this, this game is really good, and like, you know, even the characters, like, they're tropey for sure, they're anime tropes, but they're all really well fleshed out and. I mean, like, even your side stories and, you know, optional missions and stuff, all of those are character-focused and character-driven. You know, sometimes they don't even involve a battle. You know, it's about getting something for somebody and, you know, solving this mystery that is part of this person's personality and you learn more about them. And I love that. I love just a good character-driven RPG. <laughs> I think I'd be very surprised uh, from all the trailers and everything that I've heard and seen of this game I would be very surprised if the characters didn't have those like tropey anime elements to it but yeah I don't necessarily view that as a bad thing like sometimes it's it's like your guilty pleasure and uh, there definitely is an amount of enjoyment that you can get from 
kind of diving into those tropes. It's what the game does with them that really kind of makes them unique and either makes them grown worthy or just very fascinating and interesting. Yeah, and I think that that's actually um, a point that I think doesn't get talked about enough about this game. Like those kinds of anime tropes and stuff like that, they can very easily, you know, get, you know, grown worthy or gross or whatever, but they actually go the classy route way more often. Like, for example, there is this character who she's like really young, like maybe 14 or something like that. And she is going to be she's a singer and she's like kind of having, you know, middling success. And she so easily could be this, you know, kind of gross depiction of a 14 year old um, that's like grossly sexualized, which, you know, happens in Japan. I mean, look at anime. <laughs> and this character, her name is Mamori. Uh, mm. She is actually a classier depiction of that. She's not sexualized in any way that they could have done it. You know, there's still tropes in there, but they, they go the classier route more often than not, for sure. Mm. So, Tokyo Mirage Sessions, a solid S JRPG. Would recommend. <laughs> Definitely. I kind of can't put it down. From how much you've talked about this game and knowing that this is a remake and you're still experiencing all that, I really can't blame you. Yeah, it's not a remake, but a re-release, an updated port. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I really would love to have you give this game a go, Galen, and hear your opinions on this. I've said it before, I have had my eyes on this game back when it came out for the Wii U, so... I think this is definitely going to be the time. I mean, <laughs> when Animal Crossing comes out, I'm going to need to play something to keep myself occupied when my wife uh, <laughs> plays it. <laughs> well, thankfully, you can get a second Switch because that Animal Crossing limited edition Switch, you seen that? Uh, not only have I seen it, I pre-ordered it. <laughs> you did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't fault you for it. It is gorgeous. It is so, so pretty. <laughs> I, I seriously, I thought it was a fan-made one when I saw it because it was so nice. No, 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 no. And it, if you guys listening to this have not seen this thing, this thing looks amazing. It's got this, like, pastel, like, teal, and it's, like, a blue and a green controller. Yeah, combo. I would call it, like, teal and mint. That's what I would yes, call it. Yes, that, that would be perfect. Um... It is the original, or it's the original Switch, not the uh, Switch Lite. Let's see what else. It uh, it has a custom the dock. dock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, which we have. I think the last one that we've seen that's been like that was the Smash Bros. one. What did the Smash Bros. one look like? There was there was a limited edition dock for the Smash. Yeah, th there was a there's a special edition one that came out for that. Hmm. So, you know, I'll look the, that only, up. the only nice one that comes to mind is actually the, and I think it was Japan only, the Disney Tsum Tsum one. <laughs> yeah, I definitely don't think that came to the States. <laughs> yeah, for whatever reason, that that was a really, really nice looking one. And yeah. uh, I mean, even the home button on the Joy-Con was actually a Mickey Mouse head. Like they put a lot of <laughs> like interesting little details in there. But this is the nicest one we've seen for limited edition consoles so far. Yeah. Because before, like, kind of Pokemon Let's Go comes to mind where Pikachu and Eevee were on the dock, but it looked like it was just like a decal or a sticker on, yeah. on the dock. And it just kind of looked a little cheap. I thought it was cute, but just looked a little cheap. You could have done more with it. This is what I'm talking about. Like, the whole dock is, like, white and colored on the front, and it's got mm -hmm. Tom Nook, and it just looks so cute. Just looks, just a lot of effort and love went into that design. I also want to give special shout out to the back design of it too, because they didn't just go with a standard like matte or gloss backing to it. They actually put in some like design waves and Animal Crossing symbols and things like that to it as well. Yeah. So it just overall, this is a fantastic looking console. And I'm very glad that my wife and I were actually talking about, hey, do you want to get your own Switch <laughs> so you can like take this around when you go to work and you're traveling around places right and right yeah it's just when this came out i sent her a couple of images she got back to me about five minutes and was like please give me this <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah all all you need is like someone to influence your purchase and you're like i'll do it 
Mm -hmm. You're basically like ready to press uh, purchase at any given time. And you're like, will somebody, will somebody encourage me? Yeah, basically. (laughs) That's how I've acquired most of the things. But anyway, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Galen, what is the other game that you've been playing this week? Oh, yeah. Uh, I've also been playing a lot of Dragon's Crown Pro on the PS4. Have you heard of this game, first off? Oh, absolutely. But maybe some of our listeners have not heard of this game. Tell them about it. Thank you for the segue. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So Dragon's Crown and Dragon's Crown Pro is a, what would you call it? A side-scrolling beat-em-up kind of in the vein of, like, Golden Axe. And what was that? What was that one that you played on your Let's Play show? Uh, the... The the Capcom Capcom one. That was probably King of Dragons that we played. Yes, that's the one. It's very similar to that as well. So Yeah, 2D kind of hack and slash. (laughs) GameMarried.com. Anyway. (laughs) Not .com. Not .com. Uh, No, it is a high fantasy inspired side-scrolling beat-em-up. There is a leveling component that goes to it. So you can level up your characters. There are different aspects and equipment that you can put on. It is interesting because while the we- weapon archetypes are the same for your similar character, like if I'm playing a dwarf personally, and dwarves have two axes, but the different types of axes you equip, like aesthetically, the weapons change, and I always love that small attention to detail. So it's not just a grind for better equipment and then adding it as a stat and then seeing no other benefit you actually see the differences and i love that there's a couple of times yeah there's a couple of times that i've equipped a weapon and then saw my character and was like whoa what the hell is that thing <laughs> and i think that's also a point that you should um tell people about this game is visually very very striking it's a vanilla wear this game, right? th- yes this is the reason you want to play this game it's just the way that the game looks I cannot think of any other game that I have enjoyed that has had this similar kind of aesthetic appeal to it. Yeah, so if uh, any of our listeners are familiar with uh, Muramasa, the Demon Blade on Wii, it's by the mm-hmm. same studio that did that game. Uh, Odin Sphere on the yeah. like, Vita and PS3 and PS4, there was a remake for that. Yeah, and actually it's just... All of the images have this like almost canvassed oil painting vibe to it. Mm. And it just, it looks so gorgeous. But full disclosure, every single character is sexualized to hell. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I would say sexualized like kind of in like a Greek kind of way though. Yeah, like it's not... It's not sexualized like in a like a kind of crazy anime way or like a very crazy Western way. It's I don't know. It's lots of like big muscles and like thick thighs. And you know what I mean? Big muscles, thick thighs, gigantic breasts. Like, yeah, especially if you are just playing as the witch because. Oh, right, right, right. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) But it's it's definitely like an artistic choice rather than like an exploitative one. Yeah, and it's, I feel really weird about saying it this way, but it's not, it's not sexualized in a crass way. There definitely is artistic choices and artistic merit that kind of goes along with it. Yeah, it doesn't feel gross or anything. Like, it's definitely sexualized and like, I don't know, sexuality is awesome, right? So it's just like, when it's like such a like a cheap sexualization or like a really uninspired one. I'm just like, come on, like exactly. be creative, it, please. Sexuality with creativity, please. Exactly. And and you actually said you actually said it really well yourself. It's like <laughs> Well, I am wonderful. <laughs> it's like a Greek aesthetic to it where like for example, there's this dungeon that we went through and halfway through it, we came across this mermaid and this mermaid is just hanging out in the water and it is a side shot of her just kind of floating in the water completely topless everything is like covered up so it can maintain its t rating but i mean there is very little lack of the imagination going on here her boobies but, uh-huh yeah with her boobies uh, but it was it You're at a loss of words not, thinking about these mermaid yeah. boobies. 
uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it was erotic, but not crass. And I definitely have to give this game kudos for being able to ride that line. And I'm uh, just going to let that awkward silence sit there. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect uh, choice that, of words, Galen. <laughs> uh, with that being said, this is I'm also having a lot of fun with this game because I am playing it with my wife. Oh. Uh, we, we don't usually play a lot of co-op games because I'm a horrible person to play uh, games together with. Uh-huh, but, yep, uh, yes, uh-huh, yep. No, the, the, we're we're really kind of like vibing together with this one. It's it's a lot of it's a lot of fun, and a little bit hectic. Like kind of in the same way where if you're playing with multiple people on Smash, how especially on those smaller levels where there's just so much going on on the screen that you kind of lose track of your character sometimes. Yeah, that happens a lot in this game when there's like you two and two computer allies and then there's like six enemies and there's fireballs and explosions and a random dinosaur and uh, all of a sudden this little dwarf that just jumps out and goes cannonball and just smashes into the ground like there's a lot going on <laughs> but it is still very entertaining uh, my, my one critique of the game, though, is that while it is a very nice gameplay loop, because the dungeons are very short, like maybe about, uh, I want to say 10 minutes on average, probably a little bit less once you get to like the higher levels and you're just grinding through the same place. Mm. It goes to the, once you finish the level, it goes to a reward screen. And then all the items and everything that you find, you have to go ahead and get them appraised. Otherwise, you can't equip them. Okay. And they all have a ranking. So, you know, you've got your E-class weapons, your D, your yep. all the way up to, I believe the S is the highest that I've seen so far. Mm. But you have to do that with every single item. So it's always kind of a gamble as to, you know what the rating is, but you don't know any other of the stats compared to what you currently have. Mm. Do you at least know, like, what class of weapon it is? You know you know what class of weapon it is, and you know who can equip it. So oh, okay, okay. Uh, I'm playing a dwarf, and my wife is playing an Amazon. So if it's not something that either of us can equip, we just go ahead and store it for later. And yeah. You can have multiple weapons, or multiple characters. But once you get all that... You then get sent back to town, and then your equipment and weapons have a durability factor that kind of go into it. So you have to go to the big titty sorceress who goes ahead and fixes all of your stuff. And then after that, you have to go and resurrect the random piles of bones that you find or bury the bones and possibly get items from those lost adventurers. And then you go back into the next level, and it's just a wash, rinse, and repeat. Like I see. I appreciate the gameplay loop, and I appreciate that, like, calm in between each of the le levels, but it definitely does take a lot of time to kind of go through all that stuff. I, I bet that when you're playing co-op, too, that that time feels a little bit more, uh, you know, taxing. Yeah. Because, like, when you're yeah. by yourself, you know, you're just only thinking about your own time, but then when you're going through menus and junk like that, with a person sitting on the couch next to you, it probably feels a little bit more taxing. Yeah, and it being a couch co-op game, like, you only one person can go through their menu at the same time. Yeah, so. yeah. Is, uh, is it online co-op as well? It can be, yes. Gotcha. Galen, this sounds great. Yeah, um, I would actually highly recommend when you start your channel back up, uh, you and Cliff looking at it. Yeah, this yeah. this game is a lot of fun. Um, heck, if... You know, my wife and I would love to jump on and play it, too. We can get all four of us going. Oh, yeah, yeah. That'd be really cool. Yeah, we will be uh, starting... Or we will be reviving Game Married very soon. We just had a little hiatus because we were both very busy, very crazy stuff going on. And we took a little vacation here, so... And you know what? That's understandable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks for understanding, everybody. I highly recommend the game. Uh, there's two versions out right now. Currently, it's for PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, and the Vita. Um, I really want this game to come out for the Switch. It would be yeah, me too. perfect on the Switch. Yeah, yeah. I wonder why. I I know that it's produced by Atlas, developed by Vanillaware. It could be some, like... It is also kind of an old series. Like, the game was originally released back in 2013. So, 
uh, the pro version, which is what uh, my wife and I are playing right now, which it's kind of like a best of where it puts all the DLC in there. It does some re-recording of the voices and also it upscales everything to 4K. So those additions might be part of the reason why we haven't seen it on the Switch yet, but... Yeah, but it's an optional 4K. Like, on the base PS4, it's not going to go to 4K. And that's 100% accurate. So, Atlas, if you're hearing us, you've sold at least two copies if you go to <laughs> make a version of this for the Switch. I, honestly, I think that there's a lot of games that Atlas could easily port over to the Switch, and oh, uh, it would be an easy buck for them, I think. They're, they have a lot yeah. of games. They were huge supporters of the 3DS, so it's kind of surprising that they haven't been that big on the uh, on the Switch yet. It could, it could also be some, like, behind doors, like, uh, what is it that I want to say? Exclusivity like, uh, deal. Exclusivity. Yeah. Yeah. So, you never know, but fingers are crossed, because I really like this game. You never know. But you know who does know? The comment section's on the internet. They like yeah. to speculate. They love to shout. <laughs> so, Dragon, Dragon, what? Hold on. <laughs> Dragon's Crown. Okay, thank you. Pro. Yes. Sounding great. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's get on to the news this week. Yeah. So very briefly, I just want to mention that I went to a Grasshopper Manufacturer event in Shibuya, the new Parco building, which also houses the uh, Nintendo Tokyo store. So if any of our listeners uh, get a chance to visit Tokyo, I'm sure there's probably lots of like good... Uh, plane ticket deals this year because of the olympics happening oh yeah god i i the olympics are going to be such a oh such a headache so i'm so glad that i'm here at this very moment and then getting the f out of here because i do not want to be here during the olympics <laughs> but anyway parko building it's, it's a cool building it's a real big brand new building very cool and uh, on the ninth floor they have like an event space that they rent out and grasshopper manufacture the people behind uh, Killer7 and No More Heroes did an event and they talked about those games. They talked about Lollipop Chainsaw, uh, Suda51 or Suda Goichi. He was there uh, along with other producers and stuff and they showed off some more trailers for No More Heroes 3. Nothing like too new, um, but they also talked about little ideas that they had and gave away little bits of information. They did a lot of uh, music talk uh, there and they had DJs and all the DJs that worked on like Travis Strikes Again and they're also probably like Suda kind of hinted at it gonna be doing music for No More Heroes 3 as well mm. so it was really cool to kind of get little bits of information little snippets and I mean this just reminded me of how good the the uh, soundtrack is in Travis Strikes Again if you guys haven't played that game or whatever like at least check out the soundtrack like it is good I'm, I'll put a song at the end of the the whatever this is called podcast <laughs> episode <laughs> whatever it is we're doing here. oh god uh i'll put one of those at the end there but check it out because i'm sure that the whole thing is on uh youtube or something like that yeah but they talked about uh lollipop chainsaw as well and they mentioned how they wanted to do a sequel like suda i should say mentioned he wants to do a sequel but they don't own the rights you know i think that that's a lot of the IP that Suda has worked on is that, you know, because they're just a development studio, they don't really huh. publish their own stuff. It's wrapped up in other publishers. Yeah, 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 yeah. And for any of you uh, old freaks like myself, uh, they talked briefly about Moonlight Syndrome. Moonlight Syndrome is an adventure game from the mid or late 90s on the PlayStation. That was made by Suda and Human Entertainment. Human Entertainment, which is now completely defunct. They are famous for the Clock Tower series and other games. Okay. Uh, so they talked about that. And they're going to do a, uh, God, some sort of, I don't know, talking event or something in March. And I don't know, that that series is going to come back? Like, I, I don't know. Like, they wouldn't talk about it for nothing, you know? <laughs> but that's a wild one just to hear that coming back. I mean, potentially. Well, I feel like wild out of left field things are kind of right up Suda's uh, <laughs> alley. <laughs> That's where he thrives. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the perfect example is like, so the guy, uh, God, I wish I could remember his full name. He's known as Akun. He is uh, doing the soundtrack for normal, no more heroes three. And 
He is also a member of Rise, which is a Japanese band, and he's a drummer. Um, they were talking about like music and junk, and they just suddenly got really hyped, like, oh, what if we did a, a concert overseas? Oh, we should do it at South by Southwest. Yeah, that'd be super cool. I feel like so <laughs> many things that actually come to fruition with Suda start out exactly like that. Where it's just him talking with somebody be like, whoa, we should totally do this. Yeah, yeah, like, that dude is just super cool and, like, laid back and, you know, got this very atypical Japanese style to him that I, I love. You know, I, I said millions of moons before ago about, like, people like Suda and Swery, um, these incredibly creative and non-conventional Japanese developers making creative games. And it's like, yes, more of these people, please. <laughs> More randomness, please. Th they also had um, people from the animation studio Kamikaze Doga there at the event. They were the people that put together the trailer for No More Heroes 3 that we saw, The Return. The what trailer with the aliens. So I actually mentioned before when, you know, when we were just kind of talking about the trailer back during the, the VGA's episode that we did... I was mentioning like, oh, I feel like this is kind of like 3D animation, but then some of this is 2D animation, and not to be way up my own ass about this, but I was totally right. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm not an animator by any means or anything like that, but I, I don't know, I just have inklings about some of this stuff. Heyo. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so this studio, Kamikaze Dolga, they do really fascinating stuff blending 2D and 3D animation. I feel like 3D huh. animation is like, uh, a medium that we're still trying to figure out, or I should say animators are still trying to figure out, like, how do we use it properly? Yeah, yeah. And this studio is trying lots of stuff out. Like, it is stuff that you really haven't seen before, and that's actually going to be part of my additional DLC is, um, like, a I don't know if you want to call it a short, a short or something that they did, but Suda wrote it, and they animated it, and it's so interesting looking. Um, I don't want to say too much because I just want people to watch it, but check out in the additional DLC for that. Yeah. So anyway, just a really cool event. Great to see creative people being creative and Suda being the vehicle behind that. I, I got to speak with him for a little bit and um, talked to the producer as well. So you might see something uh, coming from me in the near future with uh, oh. Suda, you know, and uh, No More Heroes 3 maybe. Uh, so... <laughs> Nice. Yeah, nice. yeah. So just just gonna tease that a little bit. We're we're cooking some stuff up. Did you ask to have a cameo in one of his games? No, no, I didn't. I didn't uh, do any of that stuff. You know. Uh, I always Suda think it's like. Coulda. Did you say Suda woulda coulda? Yeah. Oh, good job, Galen. <laughs> oh, a real boy. <laughs> Those were congratulatory booty claps right there for you, Galen. Oh, the best kind. <laughs> you know i always think it's like a little bit weird like i i saw many people you know go up to suda and like it was a really casual event there was only like 70 ish attendees um because it was limited and i feel like it's kind of small for a press event oh absolutely for... yeah yeah well okay. it was live streamed as well so they just needed like a small audience but they and also uh, the gotcha. event space was like kind of smaller so you know they had to limit tickets so you know we were really lucky to get in yeah just many people you know going up to him and being like oh can we get a photo can we get a photo and like yeah a photo would be really cool and i don't know everybody has different uh things that they care about right but for me i, I really don't care about a photo so much you know i'm more interested to talk to people and hear about their stuff um and that's why you know i hand out my business card so that way we can tell your story so you know we can get things to people that's what i'm more interested in rather than like get a photo but i mean and i i I'm not really saying this as a dig this is really just my observation every westerner that i saw there that approached suda wanted a photo with him and i don't know just it stood out to me i suppose i i wonder this is starting to veer off into tangent territory but I what wonder do you how think much we do on this show bro you think we're you know what, telling information fact. and drawing mozart 100 fact <laughs> <laughs> no but I, I wonder how much of this has to do with uh western society and westerns integration with social media 
and wanting to put video game designers on the same pedestal of like popular figures just like almost like rock stars in a sense yeah and i mean i guess suda is definitely rock star uh, yeah image yeah but i mean also you know you sort of touch on a good point too where like i think westerners are more likely to show their faces and you know want to show their faces as opposed to a japanese audience you know there's many people that that are like you know please don't show my face kind of thing um that's way more common in japan yeah and i don't know I feel like maybe a lot of people like want to post that on social media their their picture with uh you know somebody and get likes and stuff like that i don't know it's just <laughs> just an observation i'm certainly not criticizing anybody for that i no absolutely i don't know and i'm not trying to be like oh well i'm elevated because i didn't want a photo that's that is so awful like you know that backhanded compliment way up your own ass kind of thing it's just yeah anyway i don't know just an observation <laughs> grasshopper manufacturer doing cool stuff yeah, something to have a maybe a more in-depth conversation about later. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this week we also got information about Pokemon Home finally coming out this uh, this month apparently. Uh, February. Well, yeah, th- th- this month. So the information you gotta start off by saying I think is a little confusing. Uh, yeah, there was a l- there was a lot of information that they kind of like threw out a board and say here you guys figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, so all of the info that you need to know is on our site, nintendoeverything.com. Just you know, go there, search Pokemon Home in the search bar. There's a bunch of different articles on it. There's infographics on which games can move which Pokemon via which services. And a whole... It's a web of junk. It's Yeah, let, let's talk about that first. The fact that there is a basic and a premium version of Pokemon Home. Yeah, yeah. So, like... First off, Pokemon Home makes sense in that clearly they have all these services, all these different things. They want to integrate everything into one vessel, one hub, right? So I get it. Yeah. This is the growing pains kind of thing. I get it. It's, you know, makes sense. There is uh, two versions of this. There is a basic version, which is free. Yeah. So that's good. But then there is also a premium version, which is really the real thing. And that is a paid service. Yes. So, first off, pricing for the premium plan is if you want to spend money for that, it is either $3 for a month of service, you get 30 days, uh, $5, you get three months of service, or $16, and you get it for the entire year. That's all American USD. Yeah. What is in the premium plan which has everything? Okay, premium plan, you can move Pokemon from the Pokemon Bank. You can deposit up to 6,000 Pokemon. Uh, You can place up to 10 Pokemon in the Wonder Box, which I believe they introduced this in previous versions. Yeah, it's basically. I think was the first one. Yeah, it's like a lottery system. So you put a Pokemon in there, you send it out to the ether, and then you get a random Pokemon back. And it could be uh, common. It, it has absolutely no bearing on what type of Pokemon you put in there. It's like a lot, which can be kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, you can put any number of up to, I think it's three Pokemon at once for trading for a particular Pokemon. You can host and parti- or participate in something called room trades. And you can also have a judge availability feature or function and i have no idea what that actually means yeah yeah that's supposed to come later too now comparing that to the basic version you can't move pokemon from the bank that six thousand pokemon gets dropped down to 30 that you can store up uh you can still put pokemon in the wonder bank but or the wonder box but only three as opposed to the 10 uh you can only trade one pokemon at a time and while you can participate in the room trade feature, you cannot host it. And there is nothing that you can do with whatever this mystery judge function is. And to further muddy these waters, the Switch version of this application and the smartphone version of this application, both of them have different features and accessibility. Yes. <laughs> and it's kind of like, why, like, can't you just make it so simple stupid like if you want people to pay for your service like it should be simple stupid you know yeah yeah and i mean it it's 
it's weird because I think the chart makes it a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. Like one of the comparing the Switch version versus the mobile phone version. So on the Switch, you can transfer Pokemon from Pokemon Let's Go series and the Pokemon Sword and Shield. You can't do that on the phone. You can transfer Pokemon from the Pokemon Bank on either version. Uh, you can judge Pokemon, you can trade Pokemon, that's all fine. The phone, you can only receive mystery gifts, check battle data, whatever that is, and check news, which, I mean, that kind of makes sense, but that news one is kind of surprising to me. I mean, you have news updates in something like Smash Bros, and it's just a little thing on the corner that you can click on if you want to. Apparently, you can also ch exchange your Pokemon home points, whatever those are, yeah. for battle points. Uh, but you can only do that on the Switch version. There, there must be some sort of reason why these are different, but I don't know. I just feel like rather than have it be different and confusing, it should just have the features in there and be redundant. Because I kind of understand why it's like, oh, well, no, you have this function in Sword and Shield, not the application or whatever the it hell. It actually makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, the differences between the Switch and the mobile version when it comes to... Because a lot of the ones that are Switch-specific have to do with the actual Switch games. Uh, the only ones that like, I'm kind of surprised by are the whole mystery gift thing and the news thing. Everything else, it kind of makes sense as to try to avoid like the possibilities of like cloning Pokemon and things like that. Oh god, whatever. <laughs> Pokemon were already cloned. It was in the first game. What the hell is Mewtwo? What the hell are Dittos? They're failed Mews. <laughs> Another thing I want to mention is that we... I don't think it's confirmed yet. Maybe it is, but we are definitely hearing reports that the Nintendo Switch Online service is not required to use this on the Switch. Yeah. I guess the thing to talk about is people are glad that there is this service. However... General consensus among Pokemon fans seems to be that it's too expensive. Yeah. I heard somewhere that this is like three times as much as what Pokemon Bank was. Yeah, Bank was like five bucks a year, I think. Yeah. Bank was also like way less features than this. It's true. And I think that they kind of came at this a little bit from the wrong angle. What people yeah. really want out of this service is a way to move all the Pokemon into one area and move them into their next game and stuff like that. That's what they want. They don't need a whole bunch of extra features and stuff like that. That's not like really going to entice them. That's little extras. That's nice. But this, uh, just from a consumer point of view, you know, not from like how much this is genuinely costing them to run the servers and all that junk. From a consumer point of view, this needed to be $10 per year max. You know what I mean? And I, the the free versus premium, like, there's such a large gap between what you get with those two. Because, like, 30 Pokemon versus 6,000. Like, nobody needs 6,000 Pokemon. I think Pokemon fans would disagree with you. <laughs> uh, okay. You know what? I will, I will accept any comments. If you are a person who has over 6,000 Pokemon and want that space... Send your tweets to me. <laughs> I don't think any of those crazy people listen to our podcast. And that's my point exactly. <laughs> the Mons, man! I need the Mons! The Loops, brother! So, yeah, I think people are really... Just, you know, we've been talking about how Pokemon's in a weird situation and fans are kind of jaded by that. Like, understandably so. Sometimes not so understandably so you know, upset with how Pokemon is kind of going about right now. And it feels kind of gross. And just this is yet another difficult pill to swallow. Yeah. It makes sense that this is a paid service for sure, you know, but it should have been the, the sweet spot should have been like seven ninety nine a year. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Pair back some of these features. You don't need all this stuff in there, really. Like, I, I don't know. They're doing part of this, like, service kind of game out of it, and also this, like, w functional ability. Would you ability. call it a game as a service? I don't know what this is. Like, is Pokemon <laughs> Home its own game? You know what I mean? If Pokemon Home is its own game, then yeah. I wouldn't call Pokemon Sword and Shield a game as a service. 
You know what I mean? It's just, this is this weird hybrid thing, and it makes me wonder, I was talking to somebody uh, about this last night, it makes me wonder that if Nintendo were not one of the majority shareholders of the Pokemon company, the Pokemon company I feel like would already be a micro transaction games as a service thing in its own its own vision. They would already I, be I, doing that, but I feel like Nintendo probably holds them back from that. I, I really feel like Game Freak is wanting to go in that direction. And that's kind of, not to bring up an old, you know, topic, as we've talked about this to death, but this is kind of what I was talking about beforehand when I was saying that the Pokemon franchise as a whole is going more into that direction of games as a service thing. It's, it's things like this that, you know, I could very easily see them starting to do seasonal events and you... So, you buy a thing of Pokemon a year that it just builds on top of each other and you're basically just paying for the same game you just with newer and newer content. See, that's what I think they want to do. I think that that's not what they are going to do though because Nintendo themselves typically don't do that kind of thing. They've done that in their mobile games but definitely not in their mainstay games, right? And it's true. That I think is what is holding them back and that's why they're doing this weird sort of thing right this like they have this optional service pokemon home and that helps you move your pokemon over that makes sense to me but then there's all these little weird bells and whistles you know and the integration with other stuff and it's like uh, i don't know you you also can't deny though that pokemon is one of nintendo's most f profitable franchises i mean i know yeah, it's owned yeah. by game freak but you know, Game Freak has a lot of pull within Nintendo as a company, and... I think it's the other I, way around. I think it's a delicate balance between the two, to be completely honest. I'm sure I mean, there's tensions <laughs> in the office, for sure. I don't know, that's speculative, sorry. <laughs> the fact that there are more Pokemon than there are Fire Emblem characters in Smash Bros. <laughs> oh, come on. With this... <laughs> that's like saying, like, those crazy people, those number people that are like... Uh, the number four that's the number of uh pokemon in in smash bros almost and then also this because there's blue in this so therefore the answer is this hey all i just heard from all of that is waluigi confirmed for smash that's what i'm saying bro <laughs> so anyway just pokemon's yeah. weird right now and that's the other thing too is that like it's insanely insanely profitable but then they're putting out this game that's like a little underwhelming and then they're doing the service stuff that's like Man, if, if this were like a super awesome game or like this were a very feature rich thing and that it was, you know, asking only a little bit of money, if they had just dialed it back and pushed it forward in a couple of different areas, but still done like kind of the general thing that they're doing right now, I think people would be way more accepting of what they're doing. Yeah. I don't know. Well, and I feel bad for also, Pokemon fans. I do. It's, it's so weird because this is, I feel like the entire aspect of Pokemon Home, it's just a... Uh, narrowing down that niche market like you're you're appealing to pokemon fans but yeah, the hardcore on top ones. of yeah you're appealing to hardcore ones and you're appealing to ones who would want to pay for a service to keep extra pokemon and the boxes keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller as to what would make this thing successful mm. i don't know with that said uh, one little bit of news that I am noticing from this is that Pokemon Bank is actually going to be free for, I think it was like a month when Pokemon Home comes out. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice, a nice, uh, caveat. Yeah, just, just a little bit of incentive to be like, hey, try out our new service, get those new Pokemon to come over. Really hoping that Pokemon Home works uh, without a hitch when it first comes out, because otherwise this will be really awkward. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They have a good history of that. <laughs> but honestly, though, like if any of our lovely listeners have Pokemon, you know, sitting in Pokemon Bank waiting to die, probably move them over to home or something. Oh, yeah. Because Pokemon Bank is going to go away. Just like, remember, at some you point. have to sign. Notice the Pokemon Bank is free, not Pokemon Home is free. So you will still have to sign up for the service for Pokemon home in order to really utilize this free transfer yeah because in the free version of home you don't have the functionality to move exactly. Pokemon over from bay. it's it's confusing exactly that's how they get you <laughs> moving on from this bummer of a subject let's move on 
So, some financial details came out from Nintendo, as they usually do quarterly. Yay, numbers! We're not going to get too much into the numbers. No numbers! But... <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, I, I think it's always interesting uh, to see these kinds of quarterly results come out for those of us who are interested in Nintendo and the video oh, game yeah. world as an industry. And uh, we like to pay attention to market trends here. So I like to bring these kinds of things up. Overall, the my interpretation of this is that it seems like Nintendo continues to make some interesting and seemingly smart structural changes from within. And they're continuing to diversify their assets for multiple streams of revenue and have the, the strengths of their IP as the foundation. Yeah, and especially in a lot of areas that they've talked about before, but it's interesting to see that they're actually making progress on this. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, what, what do you want to talk about first, specifically? <laughs> so number one we're going to talk about is the Switch's sales. The Switch yeah. has been on the market for less than three years, right? Uh, yeah. So the Switch has outsold the Super Nintendo. Wow. Yeah. That's a big that one. That really is a big one for me because of how big the Super Nintendo was, you know, when I was younger and all my friends were talking about it, all that kind of stuff. So that the is Switch impressive. has outsold that in less than three years. The Switch is currently at about 52.5 million consoles sold, and the Super Nintendo was at 49.1 million. Yeah. And then the next. Uh, milestone for the Switch is to outsell the Nintendo Entertainment System. The Nintendo Entertainment System sold just under 62 million. So, you know, the Switch is obviously going to outsell that. Bef well, definitely before the end of the year. Y you know, I actually can't remember. What's the best selling Nintendo console? Like, if the Switch sold more than this, this would be the best. I believe it's either the Wii or the Game Boy. Okay. I believe those are the two highest selling ones. The DS is up there for sure, but I don't remember what it was. The DS or the 3DS? Because the uh, DS. Nintendo's had a lot of successful consoles. So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Ha has it has it sold more than the Virtual Boy? <laughs> no, no. You know, that thing's, you know, nothing can touch that. <sighs> Long may the king reign. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I don't know. I just... I just hated uh, everything you just said. Li little side note to this, since we're talking about the SNES and the Switch. Um, I read something about the SNES controllers are... We're, like, back in stock for a little bit. The Oh, the yeah, ones. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if they're, like, permanently... If they're still back in stock. I but think they they're out of stock again. They came back in stock for a bit. <laughs> yeah, per I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, yeah, because I, I am thinking about getting one, because it's, like, 30 US dollars for... Yeah, it's really well priced yeah yeah <laughs> and it has a zr and zl button so you can use it on yes. lots of stuff as long as you don't need that you know stick exactly but i also uh read nintendo made a comment about that they are going to have an official like statement on the state of these controllers sometime in february so oh. personally i believe that they've been like holding off on really focusing on the production of these things to kind of coincide with some sort of I don't know, the stronger, like, joint announcement with it. Like, maybe a new version of the S... Or the... I don't know. <laughs> You're flipping and flopping and dying. <laughs> I was going to say, like, a new version of, like, the SNES Mini or something. Like, a... No way. With even more games or something. I I don't know. That's I just... the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I If you could have a SNES Mini... That could connect to the internet, and you can go onto an eShop and buy whatever games that you wanted to at, I don't know, $5 a game or whatever they would want to price it at. I'm for... with you on that, though. Like, I, I like that idea. That's what I think the SNES Mini should have been, but they also have to have the infrastructure for, um, you know, that online shop and that kind of stuff. That's what Do I think, think it should have been. They're not like, going to make a brand new version of that. People are a little burnt out on the mini console stuff. True, but I believe this takes it to a completely new level because we haven't seen not anything happening. like this before. Not happening. I'm, you know what? I'm not saying it is going to happen, but I'm just, you know, 
<laughs> the market is I'm too small on the people that would actually be about that. Uh, I think that it should have been that from the very beginning. I do. I'm, I'm with you. But looking at where we are right now, cancelled. <laughs> I don't know. But, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking for tangential explanations as to why these controllers have been out of stock for as long as they have been. Mm -hmm. Pro product shortages. Pieces are shortage. It's, it comes down to that, like physical hardware shortage. I, I, I want there to be a better answer than that, because that is way too mundane. <laughs> okay, well, then go talk to the comment section of the crazy people who are, you know, saying it's because of, I don't know, whatever crazy stuff. And Nintendo is intentionally doing stock shortages, and it's all because of their partnership with Tencent or whatever the hell. I don't know, just people would be crazy, you know what I'm saying? You know, I hear that their amiibos can read your mind with NFC chips. No wonder Mr. Rossetti is so mad at me. Yeah, yeah. Did they make an amiibo of him? I think they did. I don't think they did, but thanks for getting us off topic, Galen. No, they, they made that Animal Crossing lineup with their terrible, terrible Mario Party clone. Uh, yeah, and nobody bought them, and then they all got discounted down to like three bucks. And that's when I bought some. <laughs> I bet you did. Yeah, and then you're going to be yeah. like, oh, you all shall rue the day when the stupid uh, Animal Crossing Atsumare, the, what's this new one called? Oh my god, what is it called? New World or New Horizons? New Horizons sounds right, yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway. Wait, you said it, not me, so. You shut up. I'm going to remain humble. And you've not shut up yet. <laughs> oh, I'm going to remain humble, he said. <laughs> There you Jesus. go. Jesus. Picked up on it. <laughs> Jesus, Mary and Joseph. You know, I set these up for you, and sometimes they just go over your head. Well, that's because I'm too busy rolling my eyes that I don't see them being set up. I thought it was just because I was so much taller than you. <laughs> You're taller than everyone. You're like two meters tall. Yes. And don't you forget it. <laughs> Shut up. This is why I'm right. I'm, I'm looking at my <laughs> microphone angrily and telling you to shut up like it's your face. Uh, anyway, uh, financial resist. Live stream, you could actually see my face and tell me that I'm wrong. I don't want to see your face right <laughs> now. Up. I'd slap it. <laughs> anyway, first party and third party software sales have been increasing year over year on the Nintendo Switch. The third party sales have increased more than 50% over the previous year. We have further details on our site. We got charts and all that junk. Go to nintendoeverything.com to see more details on that. But that is so good to hear, you know, just continuous yeah. growth. You know, with all the talk about, you know, the Xbox One X Pro Master System, whatever, and the PlayStation 5. Like, oh, I wish it's... they would just call it the Master System. That would have been great. <laughs> really? Uh... No, it's just, it's really, you know, calming to hear just Nintendo just being like, hey, we're just making good games. You guys figure out your techno babble. We're just going to do our own thing. And it's like, that's awesome. Well, that's I'm, exactly what I want. <laughs> I'm less critical of that. Like, I just like to see everyone doing well because it's good for the industry. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. For example, like... Microsoft didn't do very well at all this this past uh, generation, so I really do hope that they knock it out of the park um, the next generation because the industry is healthier when everyone does well. It's true. It's a shame that Stadia was a big old floppity flop. Yeah, Stadia, that... Good in theory, but I don't think we're there yet. No, good in what they lied to you about what it would be in theory. What What it actually was was like, this is a bad pricing structure. Well, yeah. Anyway, well, but it's a shame that, like, you know, <laughs> it, it couldn't have been better because that would encourage more, uh, what, competition, and then, you know, it's, it's healthy Industry for the Industry growth, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, in addition to this, we also got a little bit of information about the Super Nintendo World at Universal Studios Japan in Osaka. Yeah. It's going to be opening up before the Olympics. It's still on a, uh, what's that called? Schedule? Yep. And they detailed a couple of different things. They're going to have a Mario Kart uh, thing. I don't know. Experience, whatever. <laughs> There's also going to be a Mario 
this is a quote here. Mario game-like experience, end quote. Whatever the hell that means. Hmm. There's also going to be a Yoshi-themed ride. That's, um, That's what I'm so excited for. Okay, I the the Mario game experience, I'm imagining some sort of obstacle course. But the That'd Yoshi-themed ride, I'm really hoping it's just Yoshi Safari. Oh, that'd be cool, yeah. Like, everybody gets their little, um, oh god, NES Super Scopes. Yeah. And they just go on the ride, and they just have fun. That would be really good. I would whip woo we all about that. Lifelong dream for you, right? <laughs> sure. And then, of course, there will be restaurants and shops and all that junk. And... This is what I was alluding to when we were talking about, like, Nintendo diversifying their interests and everything. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I'm very happy to hear that this is continuing on on pace. Yeah. Uh, it, it's something that Nintendo really should have been doing, you know, several years earlier. But you know what? They're doing mm. it now, and that's good. Because they have some of the strongest IP in the world, right? Most recognizable oh, yeah. characters and stuff. 100%. And in order to get more exposure, not just in the video game market, especially because, you know, video game market is a young market and a very volatile one. You gotta diversify your interests. Yeah. So, it's a very so, smart decision. Question. What? Purely hypothetical. Oh, a big surprise there. <laughs> what would you want to see... Uh, IP wise come to uh, Nintendo world. Okay. Yeah. So just before I answer that, um, I have seen, you know, people online, you know, kind of complaining, like this is called super Nintendo world. Why is it only Mario stuff? Right. Mm -hmm. We have to remember um, that like universal studios, they change things out constantly. Like they kind of yeah. have their, like in terms of like a physical and technical standpoint, they have these rides and they have these uh, attractions. They get repurposed all the time like for example i was at usj uh i think last year or two years ago i don't remember but the water world um uh, exhibit or stage was then repurposed to be one piece you know so <laughs> stuff changes out all the time nintendo is totally going to change stuff out they're doing their yeah. safest and most recognizable ip right now for the olympics you know they're going to put in things that are more popular Probably they'll do something Zelda related, something Splatoon related, at least in Osaka, um, because of how big it is in Japan. And you know, <laughs> we'll see some stuff happening for sure. So I uh, I would love to see a Legend of Zelda like Link's crossbow training, yeah, uh, section. <laughs> I, I think that'd be a lot of fun. I actually was on the same path with that. I want to see kind of like a Nintendo Land kind of thing. Uh, yeah, you remember that game? That it was the the launch for game the Wii, on Wii U. U. Yeah. And uh, you played as, like, me's in an amusement park, uh, shooting bows and using your sword against enemies. And it was so cute. Man, I, I liked Nintendo Land a lot, or at least some of those mini games. You know, it was, Same here. It was a good opening game, for sure. But it was yeah. cute because everything looked, like, stitched together. And, you know, you really did feel like you are a me in this amusement park. So I would really like to see some of that stuff come to fruition in real life. I just want there to be a guy dressed up in a Geno, like, inflatable outfit that just walks around. And he, like, is a park helper. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but then they also mentioned uh, in this financial details, they mentioned that eventually this will also be coming to Universal Studios Hollywood, Orlando, Florida, and also Singapore. I'm game. And then lastly, they also made mention of their film that they are making with Illumination Animation Studios. Mm. And uh, Nintendo said that they are proactively involved in development and production and that they will also own the rights to the movie so that it can be leveraged for business opportunities, whatever that may mean. Mm. And it's being funded by Nintendo and Universal Pictures. It's coming out in 2022, so still quite a ways off. I like that they're kind of taking their time with it. Do we know what this movie is going to be about? Like, Not is it a Mario all. movie? Is it like... We know nothing, which is fine because Wizard it's 2? so far off. <laughs> I, I think it's just going to be an animated film with, you know, Nintendo characters, uh, probably just like Mario characters in the Mushroom Kingdom kind of thing. And I'm actually okay with that. Yeah, yeah. And Illumination is, you know, a good studio for animation because they do the Minion movies, right? Correct. Yeah. Despicable Me, the Minions. 
Yeah, those minions, they do a great job of... And I know a lot of people really don't like them. I'm so totally neutral on them. But uh, they do a great job of animating them and having them do like a bippity boppity <laughs> kind of talk without actually saying things. And that will work fantastically for um, the Mario characters, you know? Yeah. Like, for example, with uh, you were talking about Luigi's Mansion 3, where Luigi's like, oh, but okay, but uh, you know? And he, he gets his point across. <laughs> um, yeah, a- absolutely. And to be completely honest, like, I was. When I heard about this, I was a little hesitant just because I personally don't like the minions. I just find them more irritating more than anything else. Yeah, and yeah, I understand for sure. I know that they. that that industry has a tendency of like bringing that kind of that sense of humor over to uh, more of their properties but i just thought about this i view the uh the minions the same way that i do the rabbits in the sense of just yeah they're just kind of loud obnoxious mascots they're not really my thing yeah but on that same vein like Look at what they did when Mario and Rabbids teamed up for a game together. We got something that we totally were not expecting because I feel like they really, Nintendo really kind of had a hand in like guiding that path, but also giving them the freedom to come up with something new and unique. So this could actually be really interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. I think this will be a very safe movie and you shouldn't really expect too much out of it. It's going to be more of a novelty than anything, but it'll be, you know. I'm sure it'll be solid. Like, Nintendo is really emphasizing how actively involved they are in this movie. You know, yeah. probably uh, to dispel fears of the, the late 80s movie, the Mario Bros. movie, where they were pretty I hands-off. I am just super excited for 2022 going to the store and getting a box of Mario cereal again. <laughs> Th- that happened, like, last year, too. Oh, did it? Oh, yeah, that's right, for Odyssey. You Apparently you're not that excited, you're right. fake gamer. Uh, it's, you know my stance on cereal. Way too much milk and not enough driving. Oh, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you put too much milk in your cereal. <laughs> did we tell that story? I'm sure we did, but let's tell it again. <laughs> so Galen, then very briefly we'll say it. Galen and I went to the Nintendo Switch preview event in whatever uh, it was must have been in january or something like that of 2017 yeah and this, is, this is the couple months before the system actually launched so we're still pretty hyped <laughs> yeah so we went to that event and galen came to pick me up in his car and we were it was really early in the morning because we wanted to get there early stand in line yada 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 and uh-huh. so of course galen was having you know some food for breakfast and he was driving holding a bowl of cereal that had very little cereal in it, and just mostly milk. And I was like, what are you doing? You're sloshing all over the place. You're going to smell like sour milk for the rest of the day. <laughs> so I Genuinely upsetting. I fill up the bowl with cereal first, and then I add the milk. But I add the milk until the cereal starts to float. But you're driving around with a bowl of cereal in your hands. Very carefully. <laughs> Th- that's like that episode of It's Always Sunny. I knew you were going to bring that up. <laughs> because it's just as absurd and you did it in real life years before that episode even. <laughs> Stupid. This is what I'm talking about, lovely listeners, that Galen wears his own chains. This is why we're friends. He could have gotten it into an accident and I would have been very upset because I wouldn't have been able to play my Nintendo Switch that day. Then he would have been like, oh, I just, I've got such bad luck. You know what I mean? And... The real answer is no! All of this was easily avoidable! <laughs> it's frustrating being your friend, I'll tell you what. <sighs> but so worth it. So, for additional DLC... I'm so tired of you. <laughs> so, for additional DLC... Uh, as I mentioned before, I am recommending the animation short by Kamikaze Doga Studios, I forgot what they were called, I'm sorry, uh, is also written by Suda51. The animation is called Skikage no Tokyo. I tried to say that as best as I can in English and it didn't work. It just blends 2D and 3D animation in such interesting ways. This studio is really, really pushing the boundaries and sort of breaking the rules, um, I guess my perceived rules as a non-animator. And it's just interesting to see a studio try this stuff out so just check it out it's on youtube it's got french subtitles 
couldn't find English subtitles for you. I'm sure most people speak English because they're listening to us speak English, but I'm sure lots of you speak French. And yeah. eh, whatever, just it's a watch it. Do, do I, as I say. I <laughs> I caught a couple of minutes of it myself, and oh. yeah, it, it even without understanding the uh, the language that is being spoken, it was still very visually pleasing to watch. It's wild, isn't it? Did you see the coffee guy? Uh, no, I haven't gotten to that. Oh, that that part, <laughs> that's a little bit of a little bit of nightmare fuel for sure. <laughs> Galen. Yes. What what uh, thing do you think is great that isn't really, but you want to tell people about it? <laughs> <laughs> so, I made a joke, or we had a joke about this like two, three episodes ago, but truth be told, I'm actually a pretty uh, avid Star Trek fan, so I'm very excited about the new Star Trek Picard show. A mm. L- little bit of mixed feelings, because I found out the only way you can watch it is through the CBS live streaming app, and I refuse to pay money for another frickin' streaming service. Mm. However, I did find that they have, as a promotional thing, their first full, like, 43-minute episode up on YouTube for everybody to watch. So, I watched it, and I was very taken aback in a good way. Um, it's very uh, contra- or contrarian to the usual formula that you would see in a Star Trek material. Well, wait, wait, wait. Which, which Star Trek are we talking about? Are we talking about classic Star Trek? Are we talking about, like, the next generation Star Trek? Modern Star yes. Trek? The movie Star Trek? All of those have very, very different... And I'm going to say that this is very different from all of them. Because okay. it almost it pulls back a lot on the sci-fi aspect and focuses more on the character development. Um, when I was watching it, I actually got more of a feeling of what captivated me about watching something like Firefly for the first time where the sci-fi element is more of a backdrop than it is the core of what is actually going on and i can say like the the fan in me appreciated the easter eggs that they have in there but if you are not a fan you will still be able to follow like the human drama that they actually put in there uh they sew so many themes of legacy and standing up for your own convictions and what happens when those convictions are put into question against your own moral beliefs and all of this is backdropped by patrick stewart's amazing acting like oh, yeah, if he's anything always brilliant else, and everything yeah yeah like it, did you see logan uh no i need to see that i really do oh my god please watch that movie that movie has is probably one of my favorite superhero movies of all time yeah because it it made both me and my wife cry in the theater it's probably like the only good x-men movie uh yes probably it is (laughs) with that said it is easily one of the best superhero movies period and a lot of that has to do with the way that Patrick Stewart plays his character. Yeah, yeah. And watching him step back into those shoes as Picard. It, if you don't want to watch the whole episode, there is a clip that they put on of him in an interview. And the entire thing is this takes place 20 years after the last Next Generation movie that they came out with. So Picard is retired and he hasn't really talked much about why he retired or anything like that. And just the entire scene is done so well. And I have so much respect for this man as an actor. So Sounds like you got a little I, thing for this fella. Uh, it, <laughs> so, true story. When I was a kid, I actually was such a fan of Star Trek and of him. I wrote him a letter saying, hey... I'm a huge fan. If you're ever in Chicago and need a place to stay, you can always come over to my house. I'm sure my mom won't mind. <laughs> no joke. This is an actual thing. That's so cute. <laughs> That's super cute. But yeah, like I watch it. I think it's only on YouTube for a limited time. Uh, I don't know if uh, it's enough for me to subscribe to the CBS thing, but I will definitely be following the series because mm-hmm. I am entranced by it. Gotcha. You know, you you mentioned like Firefly and stuff like that, and mm. for me, 
like Firefly was never really my thing. I remember, I, I've watched it. I watched it with you. And yes. I, I remember you loving it very much. And I was always just so lukewarm on it. So think of, think of the elements of Firefly without the Joss Whedon quippiness. Yeah, and you know, that wasn't my only problem with Firefly. It was, I don't know, I, I guess I wanted a little bit more world building and I'm always a little bit more interested in like the the more lame stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, action is great and fun and spectacle and stuff, but I don't know, sometimes I get <laughs> well, that from I... other places instead of like... Space. I, I can yeah I, I can say that while this show does have its action scenes it's also kind of entertaining because Patrick Stewart cannot necessarily uh, do those action scenes oh well anymore. he's like 95 <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it, it's interesting to see how the how the show keeps your attention while kind of like circumventing those limitations that are there hiding the stunt double that they used for him to run across the screen yeah something like that probably <laughs> <laughs> like, for example, um, kind of bringing this up is uh, the Alien series, right? I, yeah. I, of course, love the first movie because I really love horror and stuff. And the second movie is nice. Um, and then some some parts of all of the other films I really like and some parts are really awful. But mm -hmm. I really like like the themes that they brought up in Prometheus and uh, a little bit of Alien Covenant. Just like the... I don't know. I don't care about like some of these characters and stuff that they're bringing up. Like, whatever what I really like is the, the world building and the more lamer stuff that they do. There's a moment in alien yeah. covenant. Uh, and anybody wants to talk to me about alien, like let's do it. Like it just, I love that. There's a moment <laughs> in alien covenant where it's like, Oh my God, I could watch an entire series of this uh, with David being like a zoologist in this foreign land and discovering all these creatures and like how this parasite works with these creatures and creates different things, things like that, that are like kind of, boring and don't really work for a, a movie um to a, you know general audience that's the stuff that i love to hear about i don't need all this mm -hmm. crazy action i don't need to see the alien come back like ah oh, man you know i honestly think that you should if you get a chance you should watch this uh watch this episode i mean like i said I it's, on, it's free but yeah there, there's the first scene in the entire show is it's Picard having a game of poker with, with Data. Oh, and that's how uh, that's how the is it the next generation that he was in. That's how that ended. Yeah, yeah. He but went and played like poker a one -on with everybody, right? Yeah, but it's a it's a one on one thing, and it's also very interesting because Data is dead. He died in one of the other movies, and that's he got boom can canonically stuck. So, yeah. and. So it's obviously like a flashback. You can't tell if it's a dream. You're not quite sure what's going on. But there's this whole remorse. And he's like calling out Data's tells or lack thereof. And like offering cream and sugar. And just doing these really weird things to kind of like prolong the game. And even Data like calls him out and is like, Sir, why are you, know, why are you stalling? What's going on here? And he just kind of looks at Data and is like, I don't want the game to end yet. <laughs> and it was just like heartbreaking the way that he delivered that line. <laughs> mm. Okay, based on your 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 insistence, I will watch this. Yes. Because it doesn't sound like it'll be my thing, but I I will I'll do it for my friend Galen. Aww. Friends. And speaking of friends, let's move on to our friendliest our listener friends. Yeah, our friendliest <laughs> segment. Our listener mail. Yeah, listener mail. We're very lonely. We need friends. Mm -hmm. If you want to become our friend by writing into our email, you can do so by writing into Nintendo Everything Pod at gmail.com. Be our friends at NintendoEverythingPod at gmail.com. Galen is particularly lonely, and if you wrote in, you would sound like this. So, our friend this week is David. Hey, David, how's it going? Hey, David, are you from <laughs> Alien Covenant and also Prometheus? That's the best part of those movies, is David. There is no other possibility. <laughs> David writes in, Hello, Odie and Galen. Hey! <laughs> Long time listener and first time responder. On the question you posed about the Smash DLC. Shortly after the first fighter pass got announced, I believe it was in the interview with Sakurai, 
possibly in his Famitsu column, that he mentioned that Nintendo picked all five characters in the Fighter Pass, and they were all third-party characters. Technically, Koei Tecmo co-produced Fire Emblem Three Houses, so Billa fits the condition of the third party, just not in the way everyone was expecting. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's definitely like a gray area. I see what you're doing there, David. I, I see yeah. you. <laughs> but I appreciate the insight on that one. Uh, personally, I love Fire Emblem, so I'm perfectly fine with Billeth. I also have a little stake in Smash, since I mostly log in for the spirits. I do think it might have been a better choice to wait until the second spider pass for Billeth to arrive, but I guess they just wanted to push for the upcoming Fire Emblem story DLC. That's also a really good point. That is, yeah, the, the synergy is very topical. Exactly. And I'm I'm telling you, I'm still really surprised that Fire Emblem Three Houses did not do some sort of free DLC to sync itself up to um, Tokyo Mirage Sessions. Yes! Like, what the that hell? Should have Give been us a thing. some free costumes, a little bit of synergy. What the hell? Yes. <laughs> Session, ikimasu! Regardless of how people felt about the reveal, I do wish people were more civil about things and not harassing Sakurai and sending threats. Sincerely, David. Very well said, David. Thank you very much for writing in, David, and thank you for being yes. a long-time listener and a first-time responder. That's I love to hear that. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> I am totally with you on pretty much everything you said. <laughs> I, I'm also really glad that Billeth came in uh, to this, like, and as I was saying earlier in the episode, uh, he's a good character. He plays well, and he he's solid. Um, I think this is more of a thing, and why people were getting so upset was that they were putting putting this announcement up on a pedestal against their own expectations and their own headcanon. Yeah, and there's no way that that can ever be satisfied unless all of these hoops were jumped through that make no financial sense whatsoever. So Right, right. And that's part of it, too, is, like, you can have little dreams and stuff like that, but it's fun to do that kind of stuff. It's fun to just dream, right? But you got to yeah. be sure that you break that away from reality. And it's like, why didn't they do the thing that I wanted? And it's like, well, that's because that's a kind of irrational way to think about this, you know? Yeah. It's just like if an old movie uh, series comes back after a very long time and like you've been hyping up like oh this is what they should do that's what they should do and then they don't do those things and you're like oh what it's like that's not the fault of the the developer or the director or the whatever the hell that's mm -hmm. your own fault yeah it's like it comes out and it tries to replicate all the things you liked and then you complain and it's like hey this is way too similar and then they give it another try and it's way too different compared to what they do and then they try one last time and it's just mediocre and everybody's unhappy and you call that a win <laughs> <laughs> and you know the the final point not too that, much of a stretch <laughs> no that's fine cynicism is what i live in um the the final point that david makes here is is very important and it's i wit regardless i wish people were more civil you know yes just the veil of anonymity that is the internet makes it so easy for people to say cruel things and hurtful things and regardless of whether you're tweeting at Sakurai and you think he's not going to see it mm -hmm. or whether you're fighting somebody on the internet just because they have a different opinion than you it's such a waste of energy when you could be spending that energy creating or consuming media or playing video games or having mm -hmm. fun like just or making a podcast or making a really really mediocre podcast <laughs> <laughs> look at it in a positive light the mirages are gonna look at the show and then just keep on moving on oh because we don't have enough performa <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i'm i can't argue with you <laughs> too real too real anyway but yes i think that it is important that you know if if any of us are listening, or if any of us are listening to this, what? If 
if uh, any of our listeners, you know, if, the, if this sort of message resonates with you, um, and it's fine if it does, like, I know I've written, like, mean things on the internet before, before realizing it, just because it feels like a normal behavior to do so, uh, because yeah. it's so normalized, right? You know, catch yourself when you're about to do that or whatever, and, you know, change what you're going to say, or maybe don't engage at all. Be more civil. Always, you know, reflect on yourself and try to be the... Uh, a civil person, a kind person, and I don't know. Try and put positivity out as opposed to negativity, and don't don't uh, hate on people for having a different opinion than you. You know whether they like Bill, yeah. whether they like Joker, whether they like Gino. Like it doesn't matter. Like just it's fine. It's fine. And also about the whole harassing a certain individual in regards to these. Like looking at it realistically, Sakurai the person does not have absolute 100 percent control of every single facet that goes into this game oh yeah but people love to just simplify and pin responsibility on one individual the figureheads you know yeah it, it's easier to blame the rock star as opposed to you know the manager that set him up for the gig i mean look at the the censorship controversy thing with uh token mirage sessions you know yeah. everyone's like who did it who did it so I can I can place my blame on the person? Was it Nintendo? <laughs> Was it Atlas? And it's like, <laughs> like, everybody just wants to be mad. And it's like, how about you take a step back from that? And you're like, why am I upset? You know, that kind of thing. Also, on a fun note, uh, Dragon's Crown, also produced by Atlas. Also produced by Bud Apatow. <laughs> also produced by Judd Apatow. That's exactly what I heard from <laughs> So the sequel to Dragon's Crown starring Seth Rogen, directed by Judd Apatow. Yep. <laughs> the, Paul's <laughs> Paul's Crown. The <laughs> uh, Paul's Crown, sure, whatever. The forty year old virgin crown. Did he do forty year old virgin? Oh yeah. Judd Apatow oh. did all those things. I mean I shouldn't be surprised. Right, right. You know, like, as much of a punchline as that joke is, like As much I of actually... a punchline as it isn't. Yeah, I really kind of enjoyed those movies when I was much younger. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen them in a very long time, so I don't know how well they hang up. Hang up? Hold up. But <laughs> Hold you know, up, hold yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What would Seth Rogen be like in a Dragon's Crown game? Go. Uh, I imagine that he would be kind of a... He would be a portly knight that doesn't really attack very well but he throws a bunch of stuff at the other guys like frantically like oh no oh yeah shit yeah. my weed <laughs> <laughs> shit yeah and then he has that laughter too the <laughs> <laughs> that, that one. right yeah yeah he does actually i i have made that connection before <laughs> the nintendo everything podcast always ending on a whimper Write into us at <laughs> Nintendo Everything Pod at gmail.com. Be the source of our whimper by emailing Nintendo Everything Pod at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's coming up? What's coming out on the Nintendo Everything website? <laughs> uh, we. What, what is it? What's, what is that? Oh, yeah. Uh, Persona 5 Scramble interview translations that I did. We're going to be putting a bunch of that out, so breaking that into the, the Western worlds. Yeah. And a whole bunch of other stuff. Actually, we have some really great stuff coming up this week that you don't want to miss. Uh, that is not just a hollow statement of like, please, please pay attention. That is serious. We got some cool stuff coming up that I can't talk about yet, so check it out. NintendoEverything.com Also, stay connected to us on our Twitter. That's at NinEverything. And our YouTube, youtube.com slash nin everything. And come chat with the wonderful Galen and the wonderful Oni Dino at our respective Twitters. Mm -hmm. My Twitter is at Oni underscore Dino. I also have an Instagram. That's uh, Oni underscore underscore Dino. Galen? And my Twitter is at Mobius087. My Instagram is true underscore Mobius. And I've been a little bit more active on the Twitter scene as of late. I actually put up a, um, 
a D&D story poll question in regards to do players like to either have their game be a little bit more railroaded or a little bit more open-ended when they are, uh, as far as their story is concerned. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's interesting to see their uh, input on all that. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Also, if there's anybody out there who wants to talk D&D with me, please let me know. Cause <laughs> He's so lonely. Yeah. Yeah. I need friends. <laughs> Look what uh, I have to put up with. <laughs> he is not wrong. <laughs> I really give him a hard time. And of course, I love you, Galen. But if you just think, oh, poor Galen. So often, first off, do not. Second yeah, off, just I go be his friend on Twitter. <laughs> you do. That's what I'm saying. You wear your own chains, man. It's true. It's true. And then I also want to mention that I have my YouTube, Game Married, G-A-Y-M-E, Married. Uh, currently on a bit of a hiatus, but we have a big backlog of uh, different series that we have. That's my husband and I. And we're going to be starting it up, you know, very soon. So do nice. stop on by. Do subscribe. We're casually playing video games over there. Any casual video games that you guys we can expect to see videos from oh i have a lot of ideas actually i'm thinking about playing token mirage sessions on there too just because i feel so strongly <laughs> about it and then lp poison lp poison oh absolutely <laughs> but i think that I like care. also watch it the one or two people that would be interested in this would uh, maybe have fun with it because, um, you know, it's set in Tokyo, right? And I lived in Tokyo and uh, went to specifically Shibuya literally every day because my school was there. So um, I can, you know, walk around Shibuya in the game and tell you about like, oh yeah, here's little stories about this or that. And, you know, some of the little, what are those called? Like Easter eggs or uh, jokes that are in there that might go over your head as a Westerner um, who hasn't lived in Japan or something like that. Um, I could maybe point some of those things out. So I think, I think that'd be interesting for a few episodes. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> That's fine. I like video games. It's cool. <laughs> so Galen, this is becoming a bit of a reoccurring theme. What life advice do you want to leave our listeners with? Uh, don't watch Judd Apatow movies. Huh. Huh. <laughs> 2020 new decade and Judge Apatow Judge Apatow <laughs> That's fine Him and Judy just hanging out all day Oh my god <laughs> Stay tuned to us next week We're getting out of here for everything Nintendo Stay tuned to Nintendo everything Bye bye <laughs> <laughs>